intelligent design. I believe intelligent design. I think that makes a lot of sense. But secularists have removed that from the scientific textbooks in schools. So I see a lot more infringement from secularists than Christians. I've heard a lot about the different sins and how they're forgiven. And one that I've heard an unforgivable is like an unforgivable sin, which is to deny the Holy Spirit. Basically, what is that? What does it look like? How do I avoid it? And what would that mean like as an unforgivable sin? It's that typical Kieran Knightley line of, oh, it's so easy to be a Christian. You can just say, hey, Jesus, I believe in you, but then live like hell and do whatever I want. And then, oh, oh, oh Jesus, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? That's grieving the Holy Spirit. That's the unforgivable sin right there. Where it's again, it's a heart condition. We know, we know for a fact when we are being genuine in our faith and when we are not. See, when I'm about to make a bad decision, I don't know about you, I don't have an audible voice. I'm not, I'm not schizophrenic, quite yet at least. I don't have an audible voice in the back of my head saying, don't do that. But every feeling and inclination in me is, you should, should, moral obligation, where does that come from? You should not do that. And I specifically will turn sometimes and say, well, and that sin, I believe, is doubting God every time. Whether it's doubting his existence. Oh, I don't really believe that God exists, maybe. Doubting his character, so character assassination, like in the garden with the serpent saying, oh, God isn't, he's not really for your best. So it, it's those things where I turn. And if I'm living a hypocritical life, where I'm not genuine in returning to Christ and asking for his forgiveness, that's the unforgivable sin. Are we still under Mosaic law without the sacrificial or temple, um, or is it only the Ten Commandments now? Great question. So whatever shows up in the New Testament becomes prescriptive. And what that means is there was descriptions we get in the Old Testament, so what happened under the Mosaic law, but we're not under that anymore if it's not repeated in the New Testament. So the prescription, there's description, and then it becomes prescriptive if it's in the New Testament. So understanding there that living by the Ten Commandments is exactly how we're supposed to live. But the Sermon on the Mount is where Jesus steps in and says, hey, it's pretty cool to be a kind person. And in the Roman Empire, it was not cool to be a kind person. You're supposed to step all over people when you had power. So understanding it's by Jesus' life, it's by the new covenant and him dying on the cross saying, no, you could not ultimately do it through the Mosaic covenant. You could not ultimately cleanse yourself. It's through me. That's when ultimately we are saved. And understanding that, hey, Psalm 86, Isaiah chapter 6, so many of these passages where people are, like Isaiah, saying, I, woe to me, I'm a man of unclean lips. I don't even deserve to stand before you, God. It's the holy God who is perfect who is great in every way, omniscient, om omnipotent in every kind of way, by standing in front of him and saying, yeah, the Israelites were pretty scared of him at times when they did wrong in the Old Testament. But now because of the new covenant, there is no fear whatsoever, no condemnation in Jesus Christ, but simply an understanding of we live by grace and his love and he forgives us when we mess up. How do you feel about just religion within schools, especially like within Texas and like states like Florida where they've been passing a lot of like pretty discriminatory bills for schools and just making making di diversification and diversity a lot harder to come by in those like states public schools so how do you think that we can look to just better those like or tear down those like discriminatory walls against like minorities and things like that I typically hear from secularism when it comes to making rules and showing narratives where you have to live in such a way where I will tell you, you are a specific person in the sense of however you describe yourself, then I have to fully say, okay, I have to use that pronoun. Now, in some ways I could see how that's it's healthy for the person who's receiving it. In other ways though, if I'm forced to do that, then there's a lack of freedom. I can love you without using a certain pronoun. And so in schools, when you have kids self-identifying as cats and you have a litter box at the door, I mean, I, I see that as problematic and that is not a biblical narrative that's getting pushed along. So what's so interesting when people try and remove the Bible from a place like school, 
Well, firstly, creationism has originally been passed through. So the idea of 6,000 years old has been passed through at times. But that's not, that's not every Christian. That's actually a very small minority. But that could be true. Our guy over here, he's a creationist, and there could be truth in that. But I understand. We don't want to be focused. Uh, intelligent design is another one. Intelligent design. I believe intelligent design. I think that makes a lot of sense. But secularists have removed that from the scientific textbooks in schools. So I see a lot more infringement from secularists than Christians. I mean, yet, unless you go back to our Declaration of Independence, based off of biblical ethics. And that's the Bible right there. We are all innately equal. We all have the, pers the right, the right, not scientifically proven, to pursue happiness. And so I would not want to remove the Bible from our Declaration of Independence and when it's being used well in the school system. How come all Christians aren't Jewish? And so when and where was that distinct like separation of Jewish and Christianity? And like how are they distinct distinctively like different from like a Christian, like European understanding and like a Jewish, like Middle Eastern understanding of Jesus? All right, so Jesus was a Jew, he was Middle Eastern. And obviously there were thousands of Jews in Jesus's time. But what Jesus did was he flipped the script in saying it's not about the nation of Israel. They were the chosen people for a time. They were a light to all the Gentiles. And that's an incredible, we all live by narratives in our lives. That's an incredible story to live by because it is the most inclusive, exclusive truth. What I mean by that is the Israelites were supposed to be inclusive of all nations. And yet they were exclusive in the sense of they were claiming a certain truth and that the Messiah would come. And that's exactly what happened with Jesus Christ. He came and he proclaimed the same type of truth, that all were created equal, all were loved by God, that he would come as a slave in order to actually connect with the, vast, the majority of slaves there in the Roman Empire. And by saying that, he's saying, no, Jew nor Scythian, it does mat not matter, slave nor free, male nor female. Galatians 3.28, Paul talks about it. It does not matter what you are, we are all created in the image of God. And that was embarrassing. That was embarrassing. We have letters from Celsus, from Josephus, who mocked Jesus Christ and Christians for that idea. And yet how odd, how odd that that idea took over the Roman Empire and has now taken over the entire world. And that no other philosophy has come close. See, an atheist will try and hit you with Greek philosophy. Sorry, it comes nowhere even near. Another atheist tried to hit us with, oh, the golden rule. Yes, the golden rule came up through other faiths. I can promise you the idea of human rights and forgiving your enemy, no other worldview or religion came close to talking about that. So uh, it talks about in the Bible, like, not to be uh, unequally yoked, like, because obviously, like, in relationships, like, if you're a follower of Christ and you're with an unbeliever, it won't, in the end, work because you believe things that, like, you're strictly following the Bible and somebody's not. But how far does it go to in the sense of, like, relationships, like, family-wise or, like, friends? Like, do I cut them off because it says not to be, like, connected with them because they don't believe the same things? And you're always going to, like, conflict on many things because they don't believe what you believe or, like, even just in general because people, like, you're around so many different people that don't believe the same things, don't agree with it, don't even know about it. So how far do you go into being unequally yoked? So unequally yoked is in reference to a marriage. You can actually marry a non-believer if you're a Christian. It's the non equally yoked, though, is a guide for you may not want to. Because if you're a Christian and you marry an atheist, you guys are going to handle suffering differently. You're going to be going to God saying, hey, God, I know you're a suffering God. Help me in this suffering. You're going to be praying. This atheist is going to be like, what? No, we just kind of, I don't know how that atheist is going to end up suffering. So that's the unequally yoked in terms of, is it smart for you to marry that person? And sadly, as a pastor, I have married people who have been unequally yoked and they have had a divorce. I'm thinking of one, they divorced within a year. And I have a big regret over that because that person, one of those people said that they were a Christian and we, and we walked through the gospel pretty well together and they were lying, flat out lying. And so they just took off out of the marriage. I had told them, please wait, please wait at least another year before you get married. And they said, please, Stuart, can we just get married now? And I, I fell into that and they got divorced within a year. 
So that unequally yoked is crucial there. But Christians sometimes use it in a way that's very deceptive and a little bit manipulative. Where they'll say, oh yes, I'm, I'm better than this believer. You know, I don't do that kind of sin. So une unequally yoked, and then they'll use it with friendship like you were talking about. Unequally yoked, I, I got to push that Christian friend away. No, that's not what Scripture is talking about there. It's talking in a marital covenant to a non-believer. And it's not a sin to marry a non-believer, but there's the wisdom in not doing it. So with parents, family members, friends, you can take a break, sure. But no, a Christian is supposed to always be the one who's looking to reconcile first. See, when I get Christians come up to me and say, Stuart, my friend wronged me. Can you give me a little blessing in, in, in sending them off forever? Literally, I've had that more than once happen. I'm thinking, well, would Christ do that? When he talks about forgiving 70 times 7, would he do that? When Paul talks about everybody, well, James talks about everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. When there's the unequally yoke talk, and I'm going to get this person out of my life, usually something happened in terms of anger. That's why Paul, and that's why James, Paul says it as well, it's not about no anger. It's not about blow anger. It's about slow anger. If you just stuff your anger, eventually it's going to either rot your bones and give you a heart attack, or you're never going to get to really have a genuine relationship with the person and reconcile over things. If you just blow up all the time, that person's going to leave. It's slow to anger in saying, why am I angry? Is this a just reason? And I need to have a conversation with this person about why I'm angry. Because so many Christians are saying, oh, unequally yoked, get out of my life. Typically because there was this type of blow up that happened. We know that God has like an intelligent design when it came to the universe. Yeah. And we have Earth as we know it in our solar system that, you know, we were made in the likeness of, of God and like Jesus Christ. And we were like made after him and everything. Is there any explanation or like reason why it's like only to Earth and not other planets or other galaxies? And is there anything that would point to that there's a, another Earth and a different galaxy in the Bible? Mm -hmm. I, I just don't know. When the Bible talks about God created male and female in his image, when it talks about the spirit hovering over the waters in the beginning, it talks about the heavens, that means the sky, that does not mean heaven, that's heavens. Yes, it's talking about the Earth. There's no reference to Mars. There's no reference to Pluto. Poor Pluto doesn't exist anymore. There's no reference to any of the, uh, the other cosmoses, right, galaxies. But is that a problem? No, I think a big creative God could create a rather big place that extends beyond our imagination. That it extends in such a point where we start to see that, wow, this was a life-permitting place where, where we can actually suck wind, where we can actually live, where we actually have bodies that are made up of DNA, that we actually have information passed to different proteins in order to form our bodies, which, by the way, if you don't have God, you don't have information. It's immaterial. Okay, that type of complexity, you're going to tell me there's no God? So thinking through that, yes, if there is another planet, sure, absolutely, there could be life. In no way does that discount the resurrection and the Christian faith. See, this is my problem when it comes to the planets and aliens. So many atheists will say, you know what? Maybe there's a God because of the complexity of this place. Maybe. Maybe. But I need God to write his name on every single atom in order for me to believe in him. I need him to connect the stars in such a way where it says, hey, Stuart, I exist. And then I'll believe in him. Oh, but then they'll say, you know what? He has to do that. But you know what? A aliens. I believe that aliens could have put us here. Easily. Aliens could have just dropped us. Now, why are they saying that? Some of those smart atheists I know have said that. Why are they saying that? Sounds pretty clear to me. They're saying that because they do not want any moral authority over their lives. Aliens will not be moral authority. They're just going to show up as little gunk. So that's, it's the worship part that atheists run from. Every single atheist is running from a cop in some kind of way their conscience is convicting them, and they don't want this moral authority to occur. The most genuine atheist I know might be the top philosopher in the U.S. right now who said this himself, Thomas Nagel at NYU. He said, so many of my colleagues here are brilliant Christians who think through their faith. That unnerves me. But I hope there is not a God because I don't want the universe to be that way. 
He's honest. Why can't more atheists just be that honest? I don't want it to be that way. Okay, that's, that's one of, if not the top philosopher right now in the U.S. saying that. Any advice to people that usually struggle with their faith or um, feeling like, I guess, lost? When I feel like my faith is going down, what do I do? I read the Psalms. The psalmist is very blunt. My faith is failing. I'm getting depressed. I'm feeling separated from God. My life is falling apart. And for the past 3,000 years, that is why so many people have enjoyed reading the Psalms. Brutally honest. Very vulnerable. But the key thing is, he keeps talking to God. You see, he doesn't allow his doubts, he doesn't allow his depression to cause him to stop talking to God. He keeps on talking. So, when I struggle with my faith, and I do struggle, I make sure I keep talking to God. Secondly, read the Gospels. Read about all the people who struggle with doubt. One of my favorite ones is Mark chapter 9. A father comes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, your disciples, they tried to heal my boy. He's an epileptic. He has seizures. He's demon-possessed. The demons try and throw him into the fire to burn him to death. I came to your disciples to ask them to heal him, and they couldn't. If it is possible, would you please heal my boy? And Jesus says, what do you mean, if it is possible? All things are possible for the one who believes. And the father blurts out a great line. I believe, help my unbelief. All right, two guys just came up to me and said, I believe in a higher power, but not in Christ. So what do I need to do? And the other guy said, I believe in Jesus, but my faith is faltering. How can I grow it? By being honest, I believe, and then help my unbelief. So that's praying, help my unbelief. That's reading the Bible and figuring out, can I really trust Jesus or not? I'm not a very brave guy. I'm scared. I experience fear. And what's that a statement of? It's a statement that I don't really believe that God's all-powerful and that He's good and that I can trust Him. So I go back to reading the Scriptures, seeking to understand who is Jesus? Is He really reliable? Does that make any sense? So Psalms, Gospels, prayer, be honest about your doubts, just the way you're being, which is beautiful. Don't cover up and say, oh no, I don't have any doubts. No, honest, vulnerable, and cry out to Christ for help. Go to church. Meet other believers who are just like you. We all struggle with faith. No one, none of us have it down perfect. Meet with other believers to worship Christ and to grow as you struggle through these different issues. And I believe that once you're with God, if you're truly with Him, you know what I'm saying? If you depart and you don't trust in God anymore, I believe you're never with Him. But once you're truly with Him, even if you depart, and you know, He'll never forsake you. So I'm saying, I'm wondering, is it possible to lose your salvation in any type of way? No. When Jesus talks about how no one can pluck them out of my hand, and then Hebrews, though, there's a counterpart there. In the, in the, so you have to look at it carefully, but don't get too caught up in the weeds, I would say, because is that person truly, did he or she ever truly come to know God? And if they truly did, and they're going to hold on to God, and he's going to hold on to them all life long, then yes, they are saved. But I would say those who have just departed and taken off, did they truly know God? See, when we debate a lot of these atheists, so many of them, exactly, so many of them say, oh, I was an altar boy, and you know, I, I got abused, and I don't even know if they're telling the truth. Yeah. But they'll, they'll say all these crazy stuff about how great of a Christian I was. And you listen to them unpack their testimony, ooh, yeah, it's, it's slightly deceptive and manipulative, I would say. And so, so no, I, I, it's not an action that makes you lose your faith. It's was I truly holding on to God, and do I want to truly hold on to that relationship all life long? Now, if I say, hey, look, I'm going to commit suicide, does that send me to hell? Well, some Catholics would say yes, that's the unforgivable sin, is suicide. Well, then I would say, well, what if I, in road rage, 
somehow died because I was weaving in and out of cars. I got into an accident and I died. Is that going to send me to hell? Because my last action was a sin. It was a road rage. No, I don't think so. <coughs> so again, in terms of nobody can be plucked out of my hand, it's about his grace. It's about how genuine I am. But somebody who starts living like Hitler and you stay, oh, once saved, always saved. <laughs> it's tough to get on board with. Yeah. What do you think about Christmas, like Christmas Day? What do I think about Christmas? Yeah, sure. I like... can hardly wait for Christmas because he has three of the cutest little girls who I get to be the grandpa to. The Bible says nothing about Christmas, about December 25th. It does say a lot about the incarnation, about God becoming a human being in Jesus Christ, and that's beautiful. Why is that beautiful? A little boy walking along the street of his hometown one day comes to a pet shop. In the show window of the pet shop, there are a bunch of puppies playing around. Oh, how the little boy wants a puppy. He walks into this pet shop, walks up to the woman behind the counter. He says, ma'am, can I have a puppy? And she says, yeah, give me your money. He puts his hand in his pocket, pulls out a quarter, gives it to the woman. Can I have a puppy? No, son, I'm sorry. Those dogs are 10 bucks a piece, and you just gave me a quarter. Little boy, dejected, puts his quarter back in the pocket, goes back over to the show window and watches the puppies frolicking about. Suddenly, the woman comes and stands beside him and says, all right, son, if you give me the money that's in your pocket, I'll give you a puppy. Little guy's face just lights up, plunges his hand in his pocket, gives the woman the quarter. Then she says to him, okay, son, which puppy do you want? He says, ma'am, do you see that puppy that drags his leg behind him? That's the puppy I want. Woman says, no, son, you've given me your good hard-earned money. That dog is lame. You pick a good, strong, healthy dog. Little boy says, no, ma'am, I want that one that pulls his leg behind him. Woman says, no, son. Little kid leans over, pulls up his pant leg, and the woman sees the little kid has leg braces on. See, the kid made the connection. I'm lame. That little puppy's lame. Therefore, I want to be with that puppy. God is not the higher force. God is not a cosmic muscle flexing in outer space. Christmas is a statement. God is a suffering God who humbled himself and became a human being, and he got the snot kicked out of him, and he was ultimately nailed to a cross, which is why suffering people have an advantage. They look at Jesus Christ, and they see a suffering God. And they are profoundly attracted to God because he's a suffering God. He's not a cosmic muscle flexing in outer space. And that is why I plead with every single one of you, put your faith in Christ, which simply means he loves you enough to give his life for you. He loves you enough to humble himself and become a human being. And he wasn't a white baby, okay? And he didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes. He was a Jew. And we're not talking about the great Western hope. We're talking about Jesus Christ, and the center of Christianity today is not the U.S. of A., and it's not Western Europe. It's Africa, Asia, and South America. That's where the majority of Christians are. This Jesus Christ is God humbling himself, becoming a little child, getting a snot kicked out of him, suffering, bleeding and dying on a cross to pay the just penalty for my sin, for your sin, you can trust this Jesus, I promise you. You cannot trust Christianity, because Christianity was used in this culture to enslave some of your forefathers and foremothers. You don't trust Christianity. You trust Jesus Christ, because he didn't have a racist bone in his body. He loved all people. He taught that all human beings are created in the image of God. He is the basis for a real life. Does that make any sense? So, another question, like, what day should we celebrate instead of December 25th? You celebrate his birth every day, okay? And if you want to go out and ignore Christmas on December 25th, I have no problem with that, all right? I personally am going to celebrate Christmas because it's a cultural tradition, not because the Bible says for me to. It's a cultural tradition. I grew up in this culture, so on December 25th, I'm just going to focus on the birth of Christ and celebrate it, but it's nothing holy. It's nothing unique. So what about the, uh, the verse that said someone prophesied about Jesus being born like yeah. months after? 
Yeah, well, well, Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. We don't know exactly what the date was that Jesus was born. So it's a tradition. December 25th, we celebrate Christmas in this culture. But if anybody's got a problem with it, I got no problem with that. Don't celebrate Christmas, okay? Don't. Because Jesus was not born literally on December 25th. Make sense? Yeah. It's just an issue I have. It's just... So, I guess... The idea that if someone accepts Jesus, yes, they go to heaven, right? Yep. So, say, like my grandpa, he's Jewish. Yep. So, and he's a great person. He's a yes. really good person. Yes. Is. And he's probably the best person I know, like morally right. Like, you know, he, he has good morals and everything. Yep. But he doesn't accept Jesus. Right. But someone who is a Christian and accepts Jesus and like, let's say, this is extreme, but someone who accepts Jesus, but rapes and murders someone, yep. goes to jail, and then at the end of their life, they're like, you know what, I'm gonna accept Jesus. But my grandpa, who's a great person morally, yep. but is Jewish and doesn't accept Jesus, he goes to hell and burns for eternity. But the person who rapes and murders people and accepts Jesus goes to heaven. That just doesn't seem like right to me. Like, you know? See, I, the, the craziness about the Christian faith is, if you do something wrong, and let's say you start living a life of tremendous selfishness, don't you want a second chance and a third chance over and over again? You generally, you don't have to be a good person. All you have to do in the end is accept Jesus. Like okay, you can do whatever you want. You bet. But you see, sir, that's American Christianity that you just defined. Mm -hmm. You can accept Jesus and do anything. False. If you accept Jesus, you cannot do anything. You have to follow him. Otherwise you are a flaming hypocrite which is why I'm really scared for all those white Christians in the United States who had slaves and who took those slaves to church on Sunday. I'm really scared for them. I'm really scared for the guy who says, I believe in Jesus, but I sleep around. I'm really scared for the person who says, I believe in Jesus, and I'm gonna steal your stock portfolio in a very sophisticated way so I don't get caught. That's scary. Because the evidence is, you have not accepted Christ, because if you had accepted Christ, you'd hate that type of behavior, and you'd turn away from it. Yeah. That was really the biggest issue for me, like, I Good. guess, Christianity-wise, just like that, the hypocritical people. Yeah. And how they, like, talk about how they accept Jesus, but, and then we'll do bad, you know? I can tell you I'm a genuine follower of Christ. You can't prove that. I might be out here because someone's paying me a lot of money to be out here. You don't know. I can promise you that's not the truth, but you, I might be lying to you, all right? So that's why you always gotta be very skeptical about people, and that's why I approve of your skepticism. You gotta be skeptical, why? Because evil's real. If evil wasn't real, you wouldn't have to be skeptical, you wouldn't have to lock your door at night. Yeah. But you better be skeptical, why? Because truth and error, good and evil, are so intertwined in this world. You better be skeptical, otherwise someone's going to eat your lunch. Yeah. But you better not be cynical, which means <sighs> trash everything. No, no, no. Look for evidence that Jesus is true or false. If Jesus is false, reject him. If Jesus is true, put your faith in him. And if Jesus is true, I don't know what your uncle decided, or your father, all right? He's still alive? It's grandfather, yeah. Grandfather, he's yeah. still alive? Yeah. Okay, remember, on his dying moment, a thief turns to Christ, who's on a cross next to Christ, and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus doesn't look him in the face and say, not sorry, you don't cut it. You've lived such a horrible life as a criminal, you're going to hell, buddy. No, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, today you be with me in paradise. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching this episode. Hit that subscribe button. We love for you to join the family. Also, want to invite you to our church in New Canaan, Connecticut. It's New Canaan High School and it meets Sundays at 9.30 a.m.